Hey, I'm Pastor Justin, and I want to welcome you to worship with the City Life Church online. Every week, countless people worship right here on this platform from regions all over the 757 and all over the world. And they keep coming back because worshiping online can be a powerful experience when you keep a few things in mind. One, ditch distraction. Put your devices on Do Not Disturb. Lock it into all God is doing in every moment. Two, get active in the chat. Whether it's greeting others, typing an amen to a song or a sermon point, or throwing an emoji or three in there. And lastly, share the link online so others can join. It's a simple act that can make a major impact in somebody's life. Because that's what we know. God wants to impact each one of us tonight as we pursue him together. So let's do just that, starting right now in our worship. Good evening, City Life Church. We're so glad that you are here tonight. You've come on this Saturday evening. Those of you here in the sanctuary, we're so grateful that you've just decided to make it your business to be here in the house of the Lord today. City Life Online, we're so glad that you have come to worship with us tonight. If you're excited and grateful to be here in the house of the Lord, can you just clap your hands tonight as we begin to lift up praise to our Father? We're going to sing some amazing songs tonight worshiping Him. But before we get started in that, can we just lift our hands as we pray in this moment? Father, we honor you in this place. We are so grateful for this opportunity that we have to lift up praise, to lift up worship to you. Father, we pray that you will receive our offerings of worship, not just our songs, but take our lives tonight as offerings of worship. Our ears are open, our spirits are open. We say, have your way, Holy Spirit, and we promise that we'll give you the best of our praise. We'll give you the best of our worship. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. Well, let's go. One, two, three. Now, City Life Church, I know you know this one. So I need you to help us lead worship tonight. You're going to be the worship leader tonight. We know in simple song, it says, Yahweh. It's Yahweh. Holy is your name. I don't want to take it in vain. We love to call you Church, what is his name? It's Yahweh. Yahweh. We know who you are. Yahweh. You are so holy. Holy is your name. I don't want to take, take it in vain. We love to call your name. Yahweh. The one who keeps his Yahweh. promise. His name is Yahweh and he's holy. holy. Is your name. I don't want to take it in vain. Say there will be. There is no one above, no one beside you, nobody like you. And there will be, there, there will, will be no other God before you. Now who is greater than our God? No one, no, no one, one, no one. City Life Church, I think you can get louder than that. Say no one, no one, no one. From the top, everybody, from the front to the back, let's raise his name. It's Yahweh. Name, you sing his name. He is holy. Holy is your name. Yes, you are. I don't want to take it in vain. You will forever be our God. Yahweh. We know who you are. Yahweh. You're holy. You're holy. Holy is your name. I don't want to take it in vain. Oh, let's raise up our declaration. There will be, there will be no other God before.
know you already know the answer to them. So who else can lead us? Lead us to freedom. What's the answer? No one. No one. Come on, sing it like, no raise one. it up. Hey. And who else can heal our sins and diseases? No one. No one. No You've one. You've got to shout the answer out. Who else can walk? Who else walks on the water? No one. No one. No one. I think we'll get a little louder in the balcony. Who else answers by fire? You say. No one. No one. No one. Oh. Can bring down the tallest of giants. No one, no one, no one. And who else can silence the roar of the lion? No one, no one, no one. No one. Hey, and who else is worthy, worthy of our worship? No one, no one, no one. Who else is worthy, worthy of worship? No one. There's no one, no one. You say there is no one, no way. No one, no way. I searched and I found nobody. church. It's a great Saturday to come together and worship with each one of you. We are privileged tonight to have our Link Missions team that's heading to Niger, Africa this Wednesday leading us in worship. So you'll see some familiar faces and some new faces. So we're excited. We have a few more people. We'll be praying over this team in a few minutes in our service. But we're just excited as we focus on missions this month of January to actually have an opportunity to send some of our own and to pray over this team and stand with them. So welcome them tonight as they're joining us. And just before we continue in our service, why don't you take a minute, say hello to someone next to you, welcome them to City Life, and let them know it's going to be a great night at church. And online, we see you, we know you, we're excited you're with us too. Jump in that chat. Our hosts are ready for you.
Well, I'm going to invite you to find your way back to your seat. If you're one of our many people watching online, I'm going to use my voice to find your way out of your kitchen, wherever you are, back to your TV or your device, whatever you're using. Hey, as, as Vanessa already shared, this is an important night for us because there is a missions team that is being sent out on Wednesday to Niger, Africa. It's a creative arts team. And uh, so they are going to be there, not just doing outreach, but also doing equipping and training and teaching. Uh, many of the local churches there on a lot of the things that we do here uh, to awaken people to the presence of God. And so it, it's we love to how it just overlaid. We didn't plan it this way. Uh, we, we do our big push for missions giving this time every year. And so we love that that this is just falling right into it because if this inspires you, what you see going out, then we trust that you're going to be inspired to continue to give generously this coming year as you did this past year. There's a card here that you need to pick up. You need to hold it a certain way. You hold it like this so you can pretend like you don't notice that it says 2022 on there. So you just hold it just like this. You can proofread something a million times and you get the box. You're like, dang it. So just, just hold it like this. Just pretend. Just pretend. So there's a QR code that you can scan on the back, and that'll give you all the information you need. And then there's just a little, there's a little logo, all the different groups that we support. Every penny that comes in for missions giving goes back out. So if you earmark it for missions, it does not stay here. 100% of it goes right back out, whether it is to help send teams like this, whether it's supporting uh, missionaries that we give an, an annual subsidy to, or, or whether it's doing things locally here in the 757 to promote the gospel. When, when you go to that QR code, you're going to find it's going to challenge you to give in two very specific ways. One is we want you to give an amount that you're, that you're, you're going to share an amount you're going to give every month. And that's a budgeted amount. That means you're going to look at your budget. You're going to say, I, I can afford to give $50 a month to missions, or I can afford to give 10 or 100 or 250 but that's an amount you're going to commit to, a monthly amount that's based on a budget. The second thing we ask you to give is an annual pledge. The annual pledge is based on faith. An annual pledge is something that you're going to pray God's going to give you a number. If you're married, then pray together. God's going to give you a number together. And then you're saying, I don't know where that money's going to come from. It's not in your budget, but just as that money comes in, you're going to, as unexpected resources come in, you're going to know, hey, God gave this to me so I can give it to fill, help fulfill an annual pledge. We, for Vanessa and I, for the very first time, we had God provide money before we even made our annual pledge. Every year money comes in for us to fulfill that. But just, just this week, we got a Facebook message from someone who we did a wedding for them five and a half years ago. And they said, is this the same Fred and Vanessa? We said, yes. She said, we, we are so embarrassed. We were going through some old paperwork. We found the card that we were supposed to mail to you that had your honorarium in it for doing the wedding five and a half years ago. And that honorarium arrived this week. And we we're like, this is faith promise month. We haven't even made our, our, our annual pledge yet. And then here it is, right? This is the kind of stuff I'm telling you that, that if you'll take that step and pray, there's going to be resources that God puts into your hands so you can put it back into the kingdom. Father, I pray for people online here in this room. As they open up their hearts to you, that they're going to hear you speak to them about a number that they're supposed to give. You're going to help guide them through the budgeted amount, but also the annual pledge. Let, let this year, 2023, be a banner year of generosity. Come on in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, I want to invite, if you are on the missions team, if you could come up and join us here, but you're not as part of the worship team, because we want to pray over them. Can we just do that tonight? If during this service, if during this service, th this idea of going on a trip to Niger, Africa, I've got these blue bands. I try to wear one every week just, just to prompt you to be in a conversation with God. If you have never gone on an overseas mission trip, you need to go on one. And, and if you say, I can't afford it, listen, listen to me. God will make a way for you. He will make a way for you. And so I, I'm, I'm, every chance I get, I'm going to put these blue armbands out here that if, if you would just be willing to pick one up. It's not a commitment that you're going to go. It's a commitment that you're going to pray. 
for God to speak to you about whether or not you should. And then there's literature up here. These two books, that's for later for the sermon. You can't take these. These are mine, or I'll have to chase you down. But, but the other literature here, this is for Link Missions. It lists all the trips all the way through 2023. Just get those, get that literature. You can go to their website. And uh, we, we believe that there's going to be teams that come out of this church, right, year after year after year after year. So, Father, if you, if you want to, can I, if you know somebody on this team, if you want to come, if you want to stand, extend your hand. If you want to come stand down here as we pray, you feel free to do that. Just find your liberty. So if you want to participate in this prayer moment, so... Father, we just lift up this team to you. We just want to bathe them in this moment of prayer. Traveling mercies, God, as they board the plane. Traveling mercies, God, as they land in country. But especially, just as I was reading this morning in Scripture, thinking about this moment and reading about the feeding of the 5,000, there was that moment where the disciples realized that they did not have what the people needed from them. That they came to you and said, Jesus, we need to send these people away. We don't have what we need to feed them. And so, Father, I pray that for the people on this team, that they will always have that same sense that those disciples had, to realize that they do not have within themselves what people need from them. They do not have within themselves what people need from them, but they have the one who does. That Jesus, just as you were with your disciples 2,000 years ago, you are with us today. And so when they're there doing ministry in Niger, whether they are on a street corner or whether they are in a church or whether they are in an orphanage or, or wherever they might be, when that feeling rises up inside of them, I don't have what people need, that they would hear and sense the prompting and the whispering of your Holy Spirit to say, hey, that's okay because the one who does is with you here and now. That Jesus, that you would be, be made known in this country because of this team. Come on, in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. Amen. Yeah, y'all can give it up one more time for our missions team. And uh, City Life, we want to welcome you tonight, whether you are here in person, whether you are online. We hope that you feel welcome. We hope, we always say, that you feel like family from the first hello. And so, church, can we give it up for our guests? If this is your first, second, or third time, we consider you a guest. We're so honored that you would uh, join us tonight. And we hope that you don't just remain a guest, that you don't just remain a visitor, but that you actually do become family. And so we try to make it easy for you to take your next steps into the family of City Life Church um, and the body of Christ. And so you'll see a number up there on the screen. You can text the word guest to that number, and it will just begin a conversation between us and you to help us to kind of uh, link you in to what we're doing here at City Life Church, help you find community here, um, help you figure out your place here, answer any questions that you might have about the church or just about church in general, about Jesus, about the Bible. Uh, we want to connect with you and to walk those next steps with you. So, um, and church, we also just want to remind you and let you know that for all of us, we're always, right, taking next steps in our journey and our relationship with Jesus. It's not just the visitors. It's not just the guests. It's all of us. And one really great way to do that is through life groups. Life groups are really where the life of the church happens. We meet on Saturdays to worship and, right, but but we come together in houses. We come together over um, meals throughout the week in our life groups. And that's where we really get to know one another. And so we want to encourage you. We want to remind you uh, that tonight we're actually having a little uh, life group reception with some cookies. And so if you need an excuse in the house of God to break your uh, resolutions, it has come. This is a sign that it is okay to have a cookie tonight, and you can blame me, okay? So we do have a cookie reception down at the other end in our cafe after the service tonight. You can grab one, two, three, four, maybe just one or two, Vanessa, I don't know. Okay, four. She said four. Um, you can grab some cookies, but also hopefully when you're down there, uh, take a snapshot of that QR code. It's going to give you the whole list of all the life groups we've got going on for men, women, families, for uh, uh, young professionals, we have a, 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 a wide variety of different kinds of topics and things that you can jump into. So make sure that you make your way down 
uh, to the other end of the building tonight for that. And lastly, church, we just want to remind you that just like every week, it is easy to give uh, your tithes, your offerings. You can head to that link that you see there on the screen, or if you're here in person, uh, there should be an offering basket at either one of our entrances as you're leaving tonight. As Pastor Fred was saying before, um, you know, it makes possible what we do, not just here on Saturday, but what we do in the community, what we do uh, throughout the world uh, in missions, and, and also uh, just to make City Life Church happen in all the different ways that, that it does. And so we want to thank you so much for weekly giving and to just remind you how easy it is to do that, whether you're here in person or online. We thank you so much for your continued generosity. So we know that tonight is going to be continue to be an amazing night. So looking forward to hearing more from this uh, team and uh, for what God has in store for us tonight. So it's going to be a good night, church. If you call City Life your home, we want to say thank you for joining us in telling the story of the gospel and living the way of Jesus. Every person longs to know God and to be known by him. So let's keep working together, pointing our world to Jesus. Be sure to check out our events promo page on our website for all this coming up in the life of our church. City Life, as we navigate both the new year and these cold winter months, it's easy to take for granted some of the blessings we walk in. Like imagine spending these months without heat, a roof over your head, a place to sleep, or knowing where your next meal is coming from. It's tragic, and there are people right here in the 757 struggling through it. And you and I both know that God's heart has moved for those people. So we're getting moving as a church, set to serve, once again, coming alongside Port, which is an organization that provides food and shelter for those that need it in these cold winter months. And we're doing our part as City Life and rallying to serve on Thursday, February 2nd. So how can you join in? Well, we need lasagna donations leading up to the second, as well as people available to serve with check-in, food prep, and other tasks on that Thursday. So let's mobilize and make food and shelter easy to find for those that need it and make Jesus easy to find in the 757 in the process. For more details and to sign up today, go to citylifeva.com slash port. Hey church, City Life will be celebrating our 17th anniversary on Saturday, January 28th. We invite you to join us for this special service as we gratefully reflect on God's goodness and faithfulness over the years. We will join with the psalmist in declaring, your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. We are so thankful for all that God has allowed us to be a part of as we have worked together now for 17 years to make Jesus easy to find in the 757. Our service that night will be followed by a meal together. And we are bringing back, are you ready, City Light? You're not ready. We are bringing back the chili cook-off. So there will be winners and losers and prizes you can sign up to bring a pot of your favorite chili at the link on the screen. And we so look forward to spending that evening together, celebrating God's unending faithfulness and copious amounts of chili. So we hope you can make plans to join us. As you continue to give generously toward missions through City Life, we've been able to come alongside an organization called Link Missions, which is a nonprofit organization created to work in the nation of Niger through strategic partnerships with like-minded organizations, both to build a stronger region and an increased platform for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be shared. Here's a testimony and an example from a man in Niger who has been impacted by your giving. It reads, my name is Abdullah, and I am the senior teacher of the Evangelical Sewing Center. I am married and a father of six children and have been teaching at this sewing and reintegration center for the poor and marginalized young women and street children for the past three years. I really do like the vision of this center in helping these students to become educated and self-sufficient. Our school has encountered enormous difficulties in trying to remain operational. The primary obstacles have been providing nutrition and having proper equipment for the training of the students. We have been blessed by the support of Link in providing food, sewing machines, and sewing materials. This has offered great relief in our ability to provide ongoing education for those enrolled at this center. With the provision of food, everyone can eat well and learn because they are not hungry. The beggar children off the street also come to eat and we share food and stories from the Bible and play games. Even though I am not yet a Christian, 
I am very interested in the stories about Christ, and I have been able to witness changes in the lives of the students and the street children. Through this support, they are able to learn the sewing skills quickly. I want to say thank you to God who allowed Link to support us in this vision and for the provision of the necessary food and supplies for the school. God bless you. So City Life, be encouraged, keep walking in generosity, and let's continue to have an impact, making Jesus easy to find all over the world. Thank you for joining us this evening. For questions you may have about our church, visit citylifeva.com or email us at info at citylifeva.com. We hope you enjoy the rest of service. know this song as well. I don't know if I can quite sing it like Pastor Chris. I'm going to try. So sing with me. I'll make it good today. Can you just sing this chorus with me real quick? You picked me up. You turned me around. You placed my feet on the solid ground. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. Because you healed my heart. You changed my name. Forever free I'm not the same Come on, can we just sing that again? Oh, he picked us up just to clear that truth You turned me around You placed my feet on the solid ground I thank the Master I thank the Savior Because you healed my heart You changed my name Forever free I'm not the same I thank the Master I thank the Savior Out, wandering to the night. Oh, and wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. Come on, I tried with all my might. Oh, and I tried with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. Oh, we just went out.
to clear it out. Sing that again. Hell lost another one. Hell lost another one. next part. Come on, let's just declare freedom in this place. Wherever you're at today, let's just let our spirit rise to give thanks to the Lord. Come on. Get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Oh, I hear the Savior say. Oh, we get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get every voice here, let's sing it out again. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, pick this up one more time. Get up out of that grave. Yeah, you pick me up, you turn me around, you raise my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you heal my heart, you change my name, forever free, I'm not the same, I thank the master, I thank the savior. for being such a provider, for being the one who restores us, the one who keeps us safe, the one who leads us, the one who guides us. We know him by so many names. We've called him Yahweh today. We've called him holy. We've lifted our voices in gratitude and thanks. But Father, we thank you that you are the one who makes ways. You make rivers and deserts for us. No one can do that but you. Your track record, your history with us is perfect. It's unblemished. So with our hands lifted, we call you Waymaker. We call you a miracle worker. When we were wandering in darkness, you are our light. And everything we need is found in you. Some of us in this room need a healer, and that's who you are. Some of us need peace, and that's who you are. Some of us came in this room tonight looking for joy, and that's who you are. Whatever you need him to be, church, he can be that and more. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all you could ever ask or even think. And we know that you're here tonight, moving in our midst, Lord. Can you just raise up some sounds of worship, some words of worship to your Father? Let's just let him hear the sentiments of our hearts. Before we sing another song, let's let heaven hear our hearts tonight. That's what he's after. Come on, lift that up to him. Even though you may feel burdened down and weighed down, command your soul to bless him. Come on, command your soul. Tell your soul to bless him. Waymaker, miracle worker. That's who you are.
just as the heavens, earth, and creatures were. But we, we were not just spoken into existence, but blessed by breath of God, given the image of our creator as no other earthly created had held. Animals were given noise, we were given voice. Ability to communicate with words, we were given choice. Ability to choose God or the enemy. 
as humanity began to listen to this new angle of voice called temptation, sin went from existence to entering, hearts, minds, and universe, making the volume of God's voice even more essential. Satan is hard to silence. Suddenly, all these voices turn to noises of destruction and distortion, building a beat bearing down on me until this yoke no longer feels easy and this life feels like a burden too heavy. Lord, here I am in humility at his feet waiting for him to meet me. I'm lost in brokenness. Sin threatens to become my story. Despair threatens to be all-consuming. Sickness threatens to become the center. Yahweh, here I am. In these moments, he is faithful to remind me that his presence, his voice, being active and evident is an aspect of his identity. His presence does not demean, his voice does not manipulate, it heals. Jesus' voice that rose Lazarus from the dead says, I am all powerful even over the darkness in your life. Healed and fed thousands says, I care about your needs, I provide. The times they prophesied, he said, let my words be a light and a lamp. Jesus' life climaxed with the ultimate sacrifice. His final cry on the cross became the beginning of reconciliation between God and man that was centuries in the making, where the enemy thought he had won became the very place where God revealed the greatest revelation of his glory. And this is no end to the story. Three days later, his tomb was found empty. Fifty days later, fire fell from heaven and revival began. I wonder, I wonder how we would change how the church would change, how the world could change if we lived as if God's voice is no biblical fantasy, but a living reality we can walk in daily. God gave you a voice. It's time to amplify and not undervalue its impact. You have authority bestowed upon you the moment you entered his holy family. How are we as disciples, heirs, children of God, speaking life into our homes, our communities, our churches, to ourselves? This does not always look like speaking, but simply increasing intentionality, because you have authority. Psalms 16, 9 through 11 states, No wonder my heart is glad, and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. His voice, his presence restores, reveals, revives, heals, nurtures, amplifies. Let us use ours to praise his today. lift our hands and amplify our voices in worship in this moment. Let's sing it one more time.
time with your whole heart. Here I am. Here in your presence again. Just to worship at your feet. declarations how about this one he sees me he sees me he, he knows my name he hears my cry he's writing my story he heals my brokenness he forgives my sin he calls me to himself. Yes. He calls me his own. He stands between me and every enemy. He helps me carry every burden. He is ever present. always wonderful my father in heaven in Jesus' name come on and everybody said together amen amen come on you can clap it's good well, we are week two in a new series entitled doxa i'm wearing my doxa swag tonight can you see it all right okay yeah we we have some Info at citylifechurchva.com if you want some. Every one of these, I call them hieroglyphics, every one of these logos on the back represents one of the seven fundamental truths of Christianity. Our very own Justin White created each one of those. He's got some talent. There you go. He's gifted. 
Hey, this is the statement I introduced to you last week, that the seven core beliefs of Christianity, our doxa, I'm going to explain why we use that word in just a minute. The seven core beliefs of Christianity, our doxa, instruct us where to be just as much as they teach us what to know. Is, is it important that we know them? Yes. Is it important that we understand them? Yes. Is it important that we believe them? Yes. But, but if that's as far as we get, it's not enough. They, they call us to a place. They instruct us where to be. Here are the seven. They're going to pop up on the screen. God is one. The Bible is true. The cross is enough. Mankind is helpless. Jesus is life. Eternity is real. And the church is central. Do we believe more than those seven things as a church? You better believe that we do. But, but I would argue everything else in the Bible flows from these seven core doctrinal beliefs of Christianity. God is one. The Bible is true. The cross is enough. Mankind is helpless. Jesus is life. Eternity is real. And the church is central. Last week we did God is one. Tonight we're going to do the Bible is true. Each of these beliefs lead me somewhere. And when I wander from that place, or if I've never even been in that place, it will always create a feeling in me of being out of place. It will create a feeling in me of being out of place. This feeling of being out of place, especially in a spiritual sense, is an incredible gift that God gives to us. If we're not in the place that we're supposed to be in our relationship with him, something should stir inside of me. There should be a longing inside of me that is not satisfied. Listen to these verses in Genesis chapter 3, 8 through 9. I'm going to read them with you. It says, When the cool evening breezes were blowing... The man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man. He said, where are you? They were out of place. Where are you? If you're unfamiliar with the story, this is in the beginning of time when God created the world. What Claire was talking about in her spoken word. So good. I know I'm a little biased, but I'm going to say it anyways. Come on. So good. This, this idea that sin entered the world at a moment in time. And, and, and when sin entered the world, something happened. The spiritual DNA, we're going to talk about that tonight, of Adam and Eve were altered and has now been passed down from generation to generation. They were out of place. They felt out of place. God's not asking the question, where are you, because he did not know. He, he's not asking the question, where are you, because he could not find them. He was trying to speak to to the feeling that they had in their heart, and then he knew it was going to be recorded for us for all of time, and he was trying to help us understand the feeling that we sometimes, that sometimes it feels as though God is asking you and me, hey, where are you? Because we feel out of place. He's calling us back to a place where we should be. So doxa, we didn't take the time to talk about why we use this word in particular, so let, let's just give a little bit of time to that tonight. Where, where all my, I grew up in the Episcopal Church. Anybody else grew up in the Episcopal Church out there? Anybody? Any former Episcopalians out there? There you go. All right, Christoph, come on. I, I know that there are hundreds of people online raising their hands all over the world. If you were in the Episcopal Church, you did not need a gym membership because we did burpees for an hour as part of church. If you want to know where burpees came from, it came from the Episcopal Church. Sitting and standing and kneeling over and over, Episcopals, Episcopalians are the skinniest Christians on the planet. We were in shape. Clearly, I'm not an Episcopalian anymore. If you grew up in the Episcopal Church or you grew up in some other type of mainland denominational church where maybe it was considered high church, it was considered liturgical church, then this word doxa maybe is strangely familiar to you because it reminds you of a song that's called the? Yeah, yeah see? All right, all you Pentecostals, you, you, you got a little church history in you? Right, right, so, so this idea of the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow, Praise him, all creatures here below. You know it. It keeps going. It is, it is called the doxology for a reason. Now, there are many doxologies, but that is the doxology. A doxology is a liturgical expression of praise, and I would add an expression of praise that contains foundational doctrinal belief. 
One of the reasons why we sing songs of worship today is yes, to express our praise, yes, to awaken us to God, who is always present with us in the room, but also to remind us what we believe, to teach generations that are coming after us what we believe. There are doctrinal beliefs that are in our doxological forms of praise. Doxa means to think. It means to suppose. It means to believe. It means to consider. It means to imagine. And all of these words should be true of us when it comes to what we believe about Christianity. The source word or the word that doxa come from, comes from is the Greek word dokeo. It also gives us the word dogma, which you maybe are familiar with that, this idea of being dogmatic. It is a decree or it is an ordinance. It, it means that there are things in Christianity that we should be inflexible about. It, we can be respectful. We, 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 can, we, we can listen right, to, to opposing points of view, and I would say that's healthy. But at some point, there should be this final handful of beliefs that we say we cannot negotiate. And I would say these seven, they are it for me, and I hope they are for you too. If you're a word nerd and you begin to look up the word doxa and your study Bible, you will find that it's often also translated as glory. It's translated as splendor. It's translated as grandeur. It's translated as power and kingdom and praise and honor because over time that word began to take on, it evolved, it began to take on other meaning. But I like the way in which it evolved because if you understand the root of it, if you understand the origin of it, when you embrace these things that are true, guess what? It is glorious. It is splendid. There is grandeur in embracing things that God says are true. So this is ours tonight. Last week, God is one tonight. The Bible is true. Somebody say the Bible is true. Each week, I'm going to teach you a statement. Like last week, I taught you the statement that the oneness of God reveals that the nature of God is to be for others. That, that was a, that's a statement of truth that flows from this idea that God is one. Tonight, I wanted to, the Bible is true. And, and what I want to teach you, each week we're going to teach you a different phrase that's connected to each one of these seven. Tonight is that God didn't create the Bible for reading. He wrote the Bible to recreate you. Right? He didn't create the Bible for reading. You might say, well, are you telling me not to read my Bible? No, that is not what I'm saying. But if you only ever read it, you haven't gone far enough. We're invited to this place of discovery. We're invited into this place of learning. We're invited into this place of learning because God wrote the Bible to recreate humanity. To recreate humanity. It's not informational, it's transformational. In 2021, about 50% of Americans said they read the Bible on their own at least three or four times, fill in that sentence for me, three or four times a, yes, a year. Well, yes. And I was reading that, I thought it was going to say a week, a year. That percentage had stayed more or less steady since 2011, but in 2022 it dropped by another 11 points. Now only 39% say they read the Bible multiple times, Per year, just per year. It is the steepest, sharpest decline on record in Christian history. Currently, only 10% of Americans report daily Bible reading. Before the pandemic, that number is down from 14%. 14% droppage for daily Bible reading. Church attendance pre-pandemic, on average... People that, that, that had a, a local church they called home three times a month. That was the average, right? Come on. Now it's 1.7 to 1.9, right? There's, there's been this precipitous drop-off of spiritual disciplines, what we call pathways, which is going to be the series that we go into next. This, 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 there's been this precipitous drop-off. And I think one of the reasons why there's been this drop-off is that during the pandemic, people began to realize that they were just reading the Bible informationally, but not transformationally. 
I, I think people began to realize that now that they weren't going into ch- to church anymore, listen, th- this breaks my heart, that, that they realized that they weren't missing anything. That, that, that being not there and being there felt the same for them. Why? Because going to church for them had become a ritual instead of being transformational. Let's talk about genes. I'm not going to do my dad joke. You know you want me to. I'm not going to do it. <clears throat> Levi's. All right. No, not those kinds of genes. A gene is a short section of DNA. Your genes contain instructions that tell your cells to make molecules called proteins. Proteins perform various functions in your body to keep you healthy. Each gene carries instructions that determine your features, such as eye color, hair color, and height. So my genes, my genes, said to me, my body, at 55, you're going to be bald, six foot three, and a dad body. Right? That's my genes. Vanessa's genes said to her, at her age, much younger than me, said to her, genetically, that she's going to be attracted to a bald man who's six foot three and has a dad body. She can't help it. I know. There is a genetic makeup to who you are. By God's design. By God's design. There are things that he put into us biologically and physically that determine things. This is, this is part of the nature that he created. Here it comes. You and I, when we were born into this world, we were born with a spiritual DNA. A spiritual DNA that we inherited from Adam and Eve. And it has been passed down from generation to generation to generation from the beginning of time. And when we make a vow of devotion to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes, lives inside of me. If you've never read in the book of John, chapters 14, 15, and 16, you should read that this weekend. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible, get about two-thirds of the way through and you're going to find this page that says New Testament. Or if you're swiping and you just see this list of books, get to John in chapter 14, 15, 16. It talks about the Holy Spirit, but then in there it talks about the Holy Spirit being in us. Not just with us, although He is. Not just before us, although He's waiting for us in our tomorrows. When we make a vow of devotion to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. And once he gets there, he begins to do something. He begins to take this book, he begins to take this Bible, and he begins the work for the rest of our lives, rewriting our spiritual DNA. He begins to rewrite our spiritual DNA. So our soul, the consciousness of who we are, our physical bodies begins to break free from the DNA that we inherited from Adam and Eve and begins to cling to the spiritual DNA that we inherit from Jesus Christ. And then there's this back and forth that we're going to be in, this struggle that we will be in for the rest of our lives, trying to let go of the inclination of the human heart that's in us because of our humanity and begin to embrace the inclination that is in us because of who Christ is being formed in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. He uses the Bible to recreate us, you and me, to rewrite our spiritual DNA to become more like Jesus. Colossians 1, 27. For God wanted them, that's us, to know that the riches and the glory of Christ are for you, Gentiles. That's the biblical term for everybody that's not Jewish. We all get lumped in together. And this is the secret. Listen, Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance 
of sharing his glory, one translation renders it, it is the hope of glory. The Holy Spirit is inside of us, rewriting our spiritual DNA so that Christ can be formed inside of us so that we are no longer a slave and held captive to our sinful nature. Let's go to the next verse. You begin to put some of these verses together. It teaches you something. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. This is your child's confession right here. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with it. This should be a mural on the wall of the nursery. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable, miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? What's Paul talking about? He's talking about spiritual DNA. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind. I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. All of us were born into this world with the same spiritual DNA that we inherited from Adam and Eve. And Jesus says, I can change that for you. The next verse, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is alive and active. In the King James, it says quick and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit. In the King James, it says penetrating to dividing soul and spirit between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. What's the writer of Hebrews saying here? He's saying when you and I are born into this world, the spirit is instructing the soul. There's a spiritual DNA that we have. And when we make a vow of devotion to Christ, the Holy Spirit begins to use the word of God to change the influence, separating to dividing soul and spirit, freeing us from the influence that we once were held captive by that Paul talks about in Romans. So that now that the word of God, which is created not for reading, not for reading, but written to recreate us. And the Holy Spirit begins to use the truth of Scripture washing over us again and again and again. You have to take a bath, people, more than three times a year. <laughs> washing over us again and again and again and again changing, rewriting our spiritual DNA. Going back to those stats, we can change these trends. We can change these trends. I'm not buying into this belief that the church of Christ in America is adrift and is going to stay adrift. Is it adrift? I think so. Does it have to stay adrift? No, it does not. Because the people of God, the people in those churches can say, three times a year isn't enough for me. 1.7, 1.9 times a month isn't enough for me. I want to re-engage the pathways, the spiritual disciplines for the rewriting of the spiritual DNA in me. Because guess what, people? Just as your children have already inherited a physical, natural DNA from you at birth, you and I are responsible as Christian parents. And even if you are not a Christian parent, you still have a responsibility to impact the next generation that comes after you. That there's, there's something that we are tasked to do to show them how they themselves, their spiritual DNA can be transformed. In the Bible, being true leads the way. I want to recommend two books to you. They're right here. These are mine. Sometimes we give books away. These are not for giving away. These are mine. They're marked up. and you, I got bookmarks in there. But, but if, 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 if you want to learn more about how the Bible came to us, if you want to learn some more about what we should believe about the Bible, these are two great books for where to start. Church History in Plain Language, I believe, gives one of the clearest, most concise and precise explanations of how did the Bible come to be the Bible. How, how did we get to this place where these are the books that we're saying God gave to us and other writings were not, then that's a great, if you're a history buff. If, if you don't care about the history and you're just glad we have one, right, but you want to learn a little bit more about, well, what do I believe about the Bible, then this book, The Touch Point by Bob Santos is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. 
The Bible was written over a period of roughly 2,000 years by 40 different authors from three continents who wrote in three different languages. These facts alone make the Bible one of a kind. But there are many more amazing details that defy natural explanation. Shepherds, kings, scholars, fishermen, prophets, a military general, a cupbearer, and a priest all pen portions of Scripture. They had different immediate purposes for writing, whether recording history, giving spiritual and moral instruction, or pronouncing judgment. They composed their works from palaces, prisons, the wilderness, and places of exile while writing history, laws, poetry, prophecy, and proverbs. In the process, they laid bare their personal emotions, expressing anger, frustration, joy, and love. Yet despite this marvelous array of topics and goals, the Bible displays a flawless internal consistency. It always agrees with itself. In Bob Santos's book, there are three phrases that I love that help me understand what I mean and what I want you to understand, what I mean when I say the Bible is true, they are that it is inspired, it is infallible, and it is authoritative. Inspired means that I believe that even though these words were penned by many different people throughout history, it all has one ultimate author, and that's the heart of God. That the Holy Spirit inspired these people to give us these words words. It is inspired. And because it is inspired, it is infallible, which means that it cannot fail you. There are a few things in this world that are infallible. And if it's relating to people, that's a big fat zero, because all of us are going to make mistakes. The Bible is infallible. It cannot fail you. It cannot lead you astray. It cannot give you bad advice. It is never unwise. Now, for us reading the Bible, we are fallible in our interpretation of the infallible, which is one of the reasons why we should be in community so that we can look at each other and say, I don't think that's what that means. And, 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 For centuries before and centuries after, we're still trying to come into agreement with everything that we believe that this book says. I think that's part of the journey. I think that's by God's design. There's something that happens when we wrestle with one another. There's something that happens in the the tug and the pull. And even though we might not ultimately even end up agreeing, there's something about that journey that reshapes our point of view. We are fallible in our interpretation of this book, but make no mistake, the book in and of itself is infallible because it is inspired. Because it is inspired and because it is infallible, listen, it should be, in my life, authoritative. It should be authoritative, right? These build on each other. Meaning that when, when my life is out of alignment with this book, I don't turn the page because I don't want to see it. I yield myself to the work of the Holy Spirit inside of me to be recreated so I can come into alignment with it. This book was created by God, not for reading. He wrote it to recreate us, for us to avail ourselves to it, to yield ourselves in it, for it to reshape who we are, rewriting our spiritual DNA. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. Last week, the phrase that I taught you was, God is one. God is one. That the oneness of God reveals that the nature of God is to be for others. I taught you that because the more you reflect on the oneness of God, the more you realize that he is for others. And the more that you realize that he is for others, the more you realize he's for you. Not not just for others, but for you. He's for me. And the more I reflect on this idea of God being 
for me. It draws me out of where I am into a new place, and that new place is called a place of trust. When we're not in a place of trust, we're in a place of skepticism. When we're not in a place of trust, sometimes we're in a place of rebellion. We talked last week that being in a place of trust doesn't mean that we don't have doubts. Doubts are okay. We bring our doubts with us into this place of trust. But when we're not in a place of trust, we will always feel out of place. We will always feel the voice of God saying to you and to me, where are you? The oneness of God draw, compels me to come in to a place of trust with God. The phrase tonight, God didn't create the Bible to be read. He wrote the Bible to recreate us, inviting us into a place. You see, every week with each one of these seven core beliefs, there is a phrase that you're going to learn. There is a truth that we're going to teach you. And then that truth is going to teach you about a place where you belong. And when you're not in that place, it will always feel as though you are out of place. And the place that the Bible calls us to, because the Bible is true, is the place of surrender. It is the place of surrender. It is the place where we come to say to him, to the Holy Spirit inside of us, change who I am. Change who I am. R rewrite and reform my spiritual DNA, the hope of glory, Christ in me. Stand with me. God did not create the Bible to be read. He wrote the Bible to recreate us. In this closing song, I'm trusting that God's going to bring somebody to your mind. It might be yourself, but it might not be. It might be someone that you know. It might be someone that you love. It might be someone who's losing their battle within themselves. And humanity is winning the tug of war. May, may it be that your prayer would, would give some strength to the other side. So that the Holy Spirit inside of them, that they would yield themselves to his work. They would yield themselves to his power. They would yield themselves to his glory. They would yield themselves to his authority. And that wherever their lives, wherever our lives are not in alignment, that are out of place when it comes to the truths of God's word and all of the things that's in there, the boundaries and the limits, the hopes and the dreams, the purposes and the destiny, everything that's in there, the declarations and the warnings, that we would avail ourselves to them. Let it be, O oh God, that for the rest of our lives, never again, would this sacred text, these sacred pages, just be informational. May they forever be transformational, shaping us into the image of your Son and our Savior. Let's worship together.
for you to take my sins away upon that cross take I'll never know how much you love me how much it costs to redeem me to see my sin upon that cross this is why here I am to worship come on let's raise it up Just to say that you are, I've made the decision, you're all together, all together, all together, together, wonderful, all together, so wonderful, you're all together, Holy Father. Hey, before we close, just want to remind you, if you're here in the room, come up and get one of these bracelets, one of these, one of these brochures. Just If there's a curiosity story, if you have never been on an overseas missions trip, just, just come grab some of these things and, and just let them be a reminder to you to start a conversation with God. God, are, 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 are you giving me permission to go? Because if he is, he'll make a way for it to happen. He'll make a way for it to happen. I hope you'll be in prayer this week, starting on Wednesday for this team as they go out to Niger. We'll be giving you updates, especially next Saturday. Good reports will be coming in for the impact that they're having. Thank you for your generous giving that makes all of this possible. That makes all this possible. If you've got kids in the nursery at the close of the service, if you could just get them and then take them down to the cafe and give them all the cookies that they want. Life groups are starting. There's a, that cookie reception. Just come. Just check them out. There's, there's a great place of community that's waiting for you. you. You understand, right? It's not about the topics. Like, if you look at that and say, none of these topics resonate with me, then you miss the point. It's community that's supposed to resonate with you. So just pick the closest one. Even if you don't care, show up and care about the people that are going to be sharing that room with you. I'm going to invite you to just bow your heads with me. just want to create a moment of privacy. Let me just say, too, if you're watching from online, you can put in the chat, I want one of those bracelets or I need one of those brochures. If you put that in the chat, then one of our hosts can get your contact information and then Pastor Justin, someone on our staff team, will drop that in the mail to you. Just in this room, I just want to create a moment of privacy. Just, I'm not going to ask you to do anything else, but just if... If you would be willing to just use your own moment of confession to say, Fred, I, there's times in this life where I just feel out of place. I'm just going to invite you to slip up your hand where you are. Just this lingering, gnawing feeling of out of place that you just can't quite seem to figure out. I am just, just want to pray for you. That's all I'm going to do. This is just you lifting your hand. I'm not going to track you down. Nobody's on a camera figuring out who you are and is going to reach out to you. This is just for you to posture yourself in a way that says, I have that feeling. Father, you see every hand that's raised in this room. You see every hand that is raised in kitchens and living rooms and backyards and screened in porch and decks. For every one of us who feels like we're hearing you say to us, like you said to Adam and Eve, where are you? I pray for every person, for each of us, that we're going to find ourselves coming back into every place that we are supposed to be that is born out of these glorious, splendid truths that you have given to us. And if it's a place of trust, then I pray that people would find themselves moving towards that place of trust. If, if tonight it's, it's a place of surrender when it comes to Scripture, I pray that people would find themselves moving towards that place of surrender. For all the other words that we're going to learn in this series, let let it be that there would be a momentum, a gravitational pull to the places where you have called us to be. In Jesus' name, come on, and everybody said together, amen.
We'll see you next week. If you could just, for the next 10 minutes or so, there's going to be people down here at the front on either side. If you want to come get one of these bracelets or brochure, do it. But on either side, there, if you want prayer, we're here to pray with you before you go. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us online tonight. We know that one of the benefits of watching online means that you can do it at the comfort of your own home. But we also know that those comforts might be calling to you now, despite a desire to stay connected to God in this moment and to what he's begun to do in your heart during the service. If you have a minute, we invite you to stick around and take advantage of the opportunity to pray with someone on our prayer team. You can request prayer in the comments of any platform, but on the online platform, you can simply click the prayer button and a host is ready to pray with you in a private chat right here online. Whether or not you need prayer, we are so grateful that you chose to worship with us tonight. We hope to see you again next weekend right here at citylifeva.com slash livestream.